Greetings from Honduras. I'm so happy. I'm so blessed. This is a privilege to be here today. It's a gift in New Hope, Maui, because this church has been so close to our hearts. And I want to honor Pastors Janet and Dwayne Betzils because they are a gift of God for the body of Christ, and not only here at Maui, but in all the nations. So please, let's honor them with a clap, please, right now. <laughs> really, you are privileged to have this kind of spiritual parents in this house. You're, you are privileged to have them. So let me tell you a little bit about what's going on in Honduras. Um, it's been very difficult during this time, during this uh, crazy time, you know, in, in Honduras. Uh, it's been very ba bad due to COVID. Right now we have like 230,000 cases of COVID. We have almost 6,000 deaths because of COVID. And the health, the public health system cannot handle uh, severe cases, critical cases. So right now, at the time that I'm talking to you, there are thousands of people that are looking for medical assistance and the hospitals are collapsing. So the situation is very bad. The economy is very bad. And we have a lot of uh, corruption in our government, in the public health system, so that worsens the problems. So let me, let me explain to you a little bit because I understand that here is different in Maui, the COVID situation. Um, it's so bad that when you see your social media, you can see a lot of posts about people dying or losing their loved ones. So it's very sad because sometimes when you look for medical assistance at the hospital, and if you could go into the hospital, probably that could be the last time that you see your relative because you're not allowed to see them anymore. So sometimes you only receive a call and they tell you that your loved one has died and they just give you a, a, his body in a bag which you cannot open it because of the COVID and you need to do the bureau service right away because of pandemia so that worsens the problem over there. So church, we have changed. We have changed. God has changed us during this time. We have become more relevant to the pain and to the situation in Honduras. So we have learned a lot of things like, for example, how to have communion, communion virtually through Zoom. Sometimes we take the bread and we drink wine or not wine, but water or whatever we have, you know, at home. And we receive a different perspective of Passover during this time. Or sometimes we just go and, and we place oils in our doorpost, just claiming the blood of Jesus in our homes, in our house, in our family. And God is there. The kingdom of God is there. It's moving, even this situation. So we have a a fresher understanding, a fresher revelation of what it's abiding under the shadow of Shaddai. You know, sometimes you read the Bible and, and you read that you abide under Shaddai, but living in a situation like in Honduras, it's, it's real and the revelation is fresher. So Shaddai means the God of the mountain. In God of the mountain, we need to run to our God, to the mountain, because he's bigger than any problem. He's bigger than any virus. Amen? He's bigger than any disease. He's bigger than any depression. So we're having a different point of view from Shaddai. Shaddai means also God of who fights against our enemies. 
So sometimes we pray, we have virtually prayer meetings, and we only praise, Lord God Almighty, please walk through the hospitals. Please walk through the beds and, and breathe over people's lungs, you know, because they have so difficult, and God manifests in the hospitals because, for example, in our church, nobody has died of COVID, so he answers our prayers, you know. Shaddai means also the self-sufficient God. Self-sufficient God. Do you know what's the meaning of that? Do you know what's the meaning that he possesses within himself all the quality, all the quantity, all the supernatural, you know, command within of never-ending measure. He's our God, self-sufficient. He does a lack of, of nothing. God doesn't want anything. He has everything. So I'm asking you today, what do you want from him? What do you need from him? He's self-sufficient. Do you need direction? He's self-sufficient. Do you need peace? He's self-sufficient. Do you need something new in your marriage? He's self-sufficient. We have learned that. He has provided for everything because the economy is so bad. We, we don't need anything. We don't have any necessity because he is self-sufficient. So church here, I just want you to encourage you to look around, to be more relevant to this world, to open your spiritual eyes and see what the Lord is doing spiritually. See beyond your natural eyes and you can see there is a movement of God here at the island. And God wants you, God needs you, you know, to, to move in this, in this island. So here we are here, you know, as a dream. We have traveled during this time. And here we are. And I just want you to tell you that we love you. We love you. We really love you. We are one body. We're together. So Honduras and Maui, here we are again together. Thank you, Dwayne, for letting me talk to your people today. Thank you. Hello. Is it on? My name is Jaime. So just to give you an idea so you can understand better what my wife has been saying. Today, I was checking on the COVID test in our city. Our city is about 1 million people. Today, COVID test, 70% of the people who went for tests are positive. 200,000 people are positive of a million, so that means 20%. So the doctors now are deciding who they're going to take in the hospital and who they're not going to take in because there is no chance for them. Um, Sometimes we were just checking on the Facebook, a friend of ours who two weeks ago was posting something, he died yesterday. Um, we know this family who the father passed away on a Friday. Three, day la three days later, the son. Five days later, the daughter. Six days later, the mother. The whole family wiped out, gone. Now. Like she said, but God is doing something. And we as a church just need to figure out what is God is doing and be relevant. Uh, we were masked all the time, and we are visitors, and that's... Ay, San Peralta. Sorry. Clap to San. You know he likes to show off, so... <laughs> Can I share the testimony of we were sharing the car? So you, you will see we're not scared or afraid of the virus, but we want to be wise. Um, last night we were driving to Dwayne's house and we saw this uh, accident, a guy in a motorcycle, somebody hit him, he was dead. And I was telling Dwayne, it reminded me, 
This has happened twice to me, once to my wife, only twice, and only once to my wife. Uh, we were in a similar, similar situation back home. We saw this guy. We were coming for a, what we call worship night, like six, eight hours on, of only worship. So I was giving a ride back to our worship uh, director. Uh, and I saw this guy laying down, and God said, stop and go and pray. And I was, ah. So I got up. So when I was getting close to pay, pray for the guy, I heard people saying, he's dead. And they throw something over him, and I say, you know, relief. I don't have to pray for this guy in front of all these people. And God say, go ahead and pray. So I say, can I pray for him? And I just knelt. And my worship guy, he was 10 feet behind me. So I look back and I say. <laughs> so he just starts singing very soft. And I, I just say three things. Amigo, in the name of Jesus, come back to life. And I saw life coming back into him. And I saw him. You know, do this, walk up, and we pray for him, the Lord's Prayer. We don't like to share this because it's not about us. I have done the same praying many, many times over, and nothing has happened. It's, it's, it's Jesus. We wear masks here because we are visitors. I got this QR that says that I will be asked in some places to check if I'm wearing my mask. So when you're a visitor, you want to complying with all the and we and when you're preaching you don't want to live a, a, a like a open gate for the enemy to have something legal against you can we pray i have a word for you it's gonna change you can we pray jesus 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 spirit of the living god spirit of the living god Make your presence here so real, so visible. Speak to us. We are hungry. We are needy. We are thirsty of you. Only you. Who else can we go to? You are the living water. You are the living water. Jesus. Hey, 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 hey. Mm. In Jesus' name, amen. I have this sermon from a personal experience. I know you're talking about influencers. And I want to talk about a guy in the Bible who is an influencer. Sometimes we don't know we are an influencer, you know. And sometimes it's worse. Because we're influencing the wrong way. Have ever happened to you? <laughs> you find out yourself you are being an influence, but the wrong way, not God's way. Anybody? Oh, come on, be real. Okay, I'm gonna call this message five percent. This is a lesson I learned it from my father. So when I was young, like most of you guys here. Uh, 1995, most of you were not born. I was working as a marketing vice president. I was in the executive world. And I was working for this bank. I've been working for this bank like for eight years. So this other big financial institution, they own an insurance company. They own a credit card, a bank, many other businesses. They gave me a call and they made me an offer. And, and the offer was 40% increase over my actual salary. 40%. I remember it so clear. 40% plus other benefits. So I went and invited my father for lunch. My father was a pastor. And I was so excited sharing with my father all the, the, the good news. I was supposed to be asking for advice, but I had already decided what I wanted, 40%. Come on, 
40%. Can you imagine? 40%. I mean, it must be dumb to say no. So my father listened to me and was very excited. And, 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 and he asked this question which made no sense at the moment. Is there any, anything wrong? You felt anything wrong or, or that didn't make sense? I say, no, what do you mean, 40%? <laughs> oh, I say, just a little thing. They say they're merging and that within the next six months to a year, they're merging. And I might have two acting CEOs. I, I was going to be the vice president, marketing vice president. So they're going to have two acting CEOs over me. And my father said, but that's very confusing. Who's going to be your boss? The two of them. But you know, 40%. <laughs> really, any obstacle that will come up because of the 40%. I was willing to take it. Has ever happened to you? Has ever? That you take a challenge and you know, I'm going to do it. So let me, let me, let, let me make my, my story short. <sighs> So I took the job, 40% increase, and uh, we started doing good. Six months went by, our, our how do you say, our, our measurements are, are, we were doing good, you know, we were reaching all the objectives, we were, we were getting the sales, uh, we were doing very good, we were kicking the, the, the competition, we, we were just, all the indicators, we were doing great. Six months later, the second CEO came into the story. So I was called, I remember that morning, I was called to my boss, who was the first CEO. He says, I introduce you so-and-so. He's going to be acting also as CEO, and he's going to be your boss. So I asked him, I'm confused. Are you going to be my boss? Yes, of course. Is he going to be my boss? Yes, of course. Wow. Confusing. So one week later, we were to introduce this new product, this new credit card, you know, with cash back and all the benefits. So I went to my boss, my first CEO. So I show him all the presentation, and he just make a few changes. He said, perfect. You're ready to launch it. But go talk to the other city CEO. That's what we call him, the other guy. So then I went and talked to the other guy. And I say, um, I'm just coming from talk to the number one CEO. And I show him the presentation. And he says, I don't like it. Change it all. It's wrong. It's not what we want. This is not good for our company. Change it. What do you think I did? I went back to the first CEO. And I said, the other guy doesn't like it, and he wants me to change everything. So he got on the phone, and they started yelling and calling, calling each other's names, you know. So I just walk away. As soon as I got to my office, I got a phone call from the second CEO. He just said, come to my office. Uh-oh. As soon as I went into his office, he started yelling me cursing and he pick up a, 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 he has this flower jar he pick it up and he threw it to me I just went like that you know and I said wow what am I doing here so I just got out and went and talked to the other CEO and explained him and he told me well this is how it's going to be for the, how it's going to be for the next year <sighs> so it got crazy and crazy and crazy so one month later I quit my job. I say, this is it. This is, this is too much. And guess what? I went to talk to my father. This time, I didn't find him for lunch. <laughs> I went to his office. So my father was waiting for me. So I walk in and I said, Dad, I have bad news to tell you. He said, yeah, what's going on? Uh, I resigned my new job. The one with the 40% increase? Yes, the same job. Hmm, he said. And he said this to me, which it didn't make sense until about 10, 15 year, years later, even when he passed away. And he said to me, 
the good thing is that you are only responsible for 5% of the mess that you have created. And I say, what do you mean I'm responsible for 5%? It doesn't make sense. I didn't hire the other CEO. I didn't create this mess at this business. I mean, I'm the victim. I mean, what do you mean I'm, I'm responsible for 5%? It didn't make any sense. So that's why I call my message today 5%. Let me say this. Talking to Dwayne, I understand most of you were not born in this island, right? So you come here for a new beginning. That's right. A new beginning. How do you know that the next time won't be like the last time? How do you know that your new beginning will be better than the last one? How do you know you're not going to end up the same way as the last time? And your new beginning can be business, studies, relationship, whatever. Whatever is for you, the new beginning. How do you know the new beginning is going to be better than the, than the last time? This is what I have learned. The problem that I have whenever I have a new beginning is the factor me. Make sense? The factor me. 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 The problem is that whenever I make a decision, me is involved. Whenever I have a new beginning, me is involved. And if me is dysfunctional, if me doesn't have the right information, if me have interpreted things wrong, if me are not aligned with God's purpose, then the me factor is going to do it again. And unfortunately for me, it's going to be the same or worse than the last time. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. Can you say 5%? Can you say own it? Own. Ah, you have to say it with an accent. 5%. Own it. Okay. 5%. You have to own your 5%. Okay, let's get into it. We'll, we'll, we'll get somewhere. Let me, let me remind you this, especially to the young people. Experience do not, does not make you wiser. Experience does not make you wiser. Evaluated experience can make you wiser. Evaluated experience can make you wiser. Make sense? Okay. I'm not speaking in Spanish, so bear with me. So, for our future history, if we don't want, <clears throat> dame agua. If we don't want to repeat, we have to own our wrong mistakes. If we don't want, thank you. Okay. Such a pretty assistant. <laughs> We've been married for, oh, I'm going to get in trouble. 30 something. I don't know how to say in English, right? So that's, that's my excuse. <laughs> so if you don't want to repeat your same mistakes, you have to learn to own your 5%. You have to learn to own your past. And that's not easy. Nobody, nobody wants to look into the past, especially to the mistakes, to the errors, because it hurts, because it's embarrassing, because if we are honest, most of the time, it's not our fault. Or at least that's what we say to ourselves. Okay. Yeah, most of, I mean, for many years, you know, like I say, maybe 10, 20 years, I never understood what my father was saying when he told me, you, you are only, you know, 5% is your blame. 
5% is your fault. I never understood that. Until we met this lady at our church, nice lady. She was with us at the church maybe 10, 12 years before she passed away from cancer. But she came to our church. Dwayne met her, met the whole family. She came to our church just right after a divorce. They were both Christians. Both families went to church. Uh, supposedly, they both loved the Lord. Her name is Celeste. So I remember Celeste, Celeste sharing her story that she got married. I mean, this guy was a, a fruitcake. I mean, he... <laughs> let, me, let me just to give you, this is what she told us. Then during the time we, we became friends, we, we realized what she told us. It was only like 20% of how crazy this guy was. Like, he never worked. He was at home all the time. But he dressed very sharply. He liked to go out. He had good places. He was a womanizer. Had many kids during the marriage. And you know what's funny? He would tell his friends, and what do you do for a living? He would swap and say what she actually did. He told his friend that's what he did. So they all believed he was supporting this lazy wife. So then the kids, they were like eight years old when they, when they got divorced. They started coming to church. And I remember when, when, the, when the little girl, Celeste, uh, she said to me, Pastor, can you check the Facebook for me? And I said, what's wrong? There is this page under my name, which is fake because I didn't create it. And it has my pictures on it. I started looking at it. And then I started to read the post. Oh, Dad, you are the greatest. Thank you for taking us out to eat today. And I said, did you go out? No, we didn't go out. So he started lying. You know, this is how, how sick this guy was. So we started posting things like, oh, oh, Daddy, thank you for your birthday present. And I said, did you get any? No, he even called. He didn't even call us. So he was, I mean, just to give you an idea how, how sick this guy was. So as we got to meet Celeste, Celeste and her two kids, Celeste was talking all the time and, and about him, the different things he has done, uh, how he, he, she was hurt. And, and I mean, every time we talk to Celeste, the subject will come up. And I remember one time, and that's when it clicked to me. And I say, Celeste, but you must have some fault on this relationship. I mean, there must be something you are to blame for. And she got very upset. How can it be my fault? He never worked. He had like four kids during we were married. He like, I mean, he, you know, went over the whole story. She knew it. You know, it's, it's amazing how she knew it. Point by point, date by date. How all that was memorized. And she knew it. And I said, Celeste, I think there is a 5% of blame on your part. That's when I got it. So Celeste didn't talk to me for about two weeks. Then she came back and say, I want, then she said, I want to talk to you. you. You got me thinking about the 5%. And she said, what do you mean by the 5%? I say, Celeste, I shared my story. And I think I have a graph there. And I share my, my story, and I show Celeste this graph. And I say, 95% of the problems are created by other people. 5% are created by me, my, of my own problems. You know what I'm saying? Yes? Make sense? Make sense? Okay. So let me, let me give you an example. Maybe somebody will say, my father was a drunk. I never met my mom. Uh, how will I know that the economy was going to change? How was I going to know that my industry was going to change? How I was supposed to ask my girlfriend, do you have criminal records? You know, how I was supposed to ask my, boy, my boyfriend, have you ever been 
psychologically treated? You know, how am I supposed to ask that question? You don't ask that. So Celeste was saying, you know, what do you mean by 5%? Celeste, let's look very careful into your story. And she started crying and she started saying things like this. You know what? My family never liked him. They told me there was something about him. They just could say what. But there was something about him that was wrong. The church people, the church, I mean, the, the, the real spiritual church people, they didn't like him. They, 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 my, my parents, that's a kid, my parents, my parents never trusted him. And you know what? Deep, deep, deep back inside of me, I knew there was something wrong with him. But I told myself, when we get married, he's going to change. Have you heard that before? Do you say things like that here? But she said this too. You know what? Deep, 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 back inside of me. I knew there was something wrong about him. But if I'm being honest, my personal life family circumstances were so bad, so, uh, uh, so they were chucking me that I just wanted to get out of my house. So I hurry, I, I, I rush the Mary, and that's what I married. So yes, you're right. There is at least 5% to blame on me. Let me, let me say this to you. If you want this time to be different than the last time, you have to take ownership of your past, of your own mistakes. The problem is when we tell a story, our story, our own story, the, the problems we have, we skip the 5%. And we only talk about the 95%. You know, he was a drug addict, I was abused. And we talk about all these things, but we never take responsibility for the 5%. Now, if you are like me, I was thinking, 5% is such a small percentage of blame on me. You know, 5% is such a small percentage. And this is what God told me. Can you imagine that I have saved you from doing the 20 or 30 percent where will you be now if it only five percent has the potential to create the chaos where you are right now can you imagine 10 percent 15 percent making sense to you yes making sense okay mm. we're going somewhere with the accent in the spanish but we're going somewhere Am I making myself understandable? Does it make sense? Okay. The problem is this. If you don't confront the 5%, then you're going to drag into your future that 5%. You're going to smuggle that 5% into the future. And this is what I know about my 5%. I don't know about you, but this is what I know about my 5%. That 5% that I can drag into the future because it's not confronted. First is the side of me that is dysfunctional. Is the side of me that is very stupid, dumb. Is the side of me that is very dark, selfish, weak, unholy where I don't let the Spirit, Holy Spirit deal with it, that 5%, that 5%, that small 5%, if I don't confront it and I let it smuggle into my future, guess what? Next time will be the same or worse than the last time. Let's go to the Bible. Let's go to Genesis. I think you have the Bible verse there. 
Let me talk about this guy. It is amazing how God takes risk with people. Through the whole Bible, I mean, like he chooses purposely the worst of the worst. Whew. I mean, you and me, us being here in church was at risk because of the decision that this guy was about to make. His name is Jacob. I mean, when, when I think about Jacob, I think about a gang member. I mean, he's crooked, lying all the time. You know, he's, he's I mean, it is very hard for me to see something good about Jacob. He's always getting into mess. He's always creating problems for him. And, and you know this, when you, you think the, it would be good if I make problems, it, it will only affect me. But the truth is, whatever I do wrong, it has a social impact. My family, the people I relate with. So Jacob, I mean, Jacob is, I mean, if I would ask you, would you want Jacob to be your son-in-law? Nobody will say yes. Do you want Jacob to be your husband? Please. <laughs> Thank you. You know, you want to do business with Jacob? <laughs> no, thank you. I mean, Jacob, I don't know why God chose him. I mean, I mean, it doesn't make sense. And, and the whole plan of God is at risk for choosing Jacob. Now, you know the story about Jacob, right? Well, Jacob, again, one more time, he's in a big mess. He's running away from his father-in-law because Jacob did what Jacob does, you know. He's crooked. Now, he has a big problem. The only place he can run to escape is to his brother. And he has unsettled business with his brother. And his brother is just sitting, you know, like a baseball player, just waiting for the right ball, just waiting for Jacob to show up, you know. And we're going to have a good time and get even with Jacob. So Jacob is at this tight place. And it's funny because when we read in verse, you have it there? Can we all read it to the count of three? That's what we do at the church so you guys will wake up and be connected. Can we read it? One, two, three. Okay, we understand that this man, in other version, they call him the angel of God, which we know is Jesus. I like this, 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 what we read here, because when I was in a little kid, especially in elementary, I almost got into a fight, you know, a fist fight every day. Soccer was the world to me. So playing soccer during the recess or I grew up playing on the streets. I don't know if you do that here. So when you play the guys from the other street, ah, I mean, when they visit us or when we went to the other street to play, I mean, we always end up fighting. So I know, I know, I know what I've, uh, ha, ha, has any of you been in a fist fight? Come on, be honest. Have you ever been in a, yeah, just, okay, good. So can, can you leave the, the Bible verse, can you leave the Bible verse there? So. Jacob, this, there are things that when I read this passage that, that get my attention. And sometimes I, I try to put myself in the story and, and things doesn't add up, doesn't make sense. First, I know there is a man wrestling with him. And uh, it says the daybreak. And you know that this man, this angel says to Jacob, I have to live soon. I have to go away because dawn is coming, right? So the first thing I understand about this is there is a new season coming for Jacob. But the angel is saying, if you are or if you're not ready, I'm going to have to leave you. It's up to you how you enter into this new season. Make sense? A new beginning. It is your new beginning. 
And, 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 and the angel is saying, I am afraid that you're not ready for your new beginning. So the next time is going to be like the last time. Can you afford it, Jacob? Okay, the other thing I noticed, wait, uh huh. The other thing I like it is that. No, before, before, the, the, the very first. Uh huh. Okay, now. The other thing I notice is that the fight is about being blessed, right? That's the fight about getting my blessing. Jacob is saying, bless me. Don't leave me until I'm blessed. And that reminds me 40 years ago when Jacob was in another fight because he wanted to be blessed. He took his brother's blessing, remember? So he's used to fighting. He's used to imposing. He's used to having a new beginnings his own way. So he thinks this way is going to be the same. Making sense? Are you with me? Yes? Okay. So he's wrestling for his blessings like he has always done. And he has always prevailed. And that's why he is where he is. Because he's like the singer, you know, I did it my way. So he always did it his way. Okay. So the angel touched his hip. And this is where it's interesting. Joseph did not know that in the spiritual world, he was limping. That's how you say? Yeah. He was limping. He did not know. So the angel touched him. So Jacob will realize his own condition. He was trying all the time. You know, he was, he was trying on his past. He had all this past behind him. Okay, let's go to the next verse. We're going to finish very soon. Then he said, let me go. This is the angel because a new season is beginning for you. I have to go. I have to live. And he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. How many of you want to be blessed? How many of you want a new beginning? How many of you want the new beginning not to be like the last time? How many of you want it to be better than the last time? Yes? So this is what Jacob wants. It's not bad. So he's fighting for it. Okay, the next. Huh. How many of you been in a fist fight? Raise your hand. Bah, come on, come on, come on, guys. Oh, girls, I know there are some of you. Yes, I know. Now. Let's be honest. When you are in a fist fight, if you're calling names, you're calling ugly names. That's right. Or you're insulting people. Is, is that right? When you are in a fist fight, I mean, you, you're, you're, you're anger, you, you, you use all your grammar, adjectives, pronouns. You call all type of names, right? To the other people. When you're in a fight, it's funny. Sometimes we get into a fight with people we do not know. So, is the angel wrong? Is, is he with the wrong guy? The, the, the angel say, what is your name? And I'm, if I'm Jacob, and by the way, my name is Jaime, which, which means Jacob, and I see many things of me in, in Jacob, I would have said to the angel, why do you care about my name? Just bless me. I don't care if you're with the wrong guy. Just bless me. What do you mean, what is my name? I mean, we're in a fight. We, we, we're not discussing about what is your name, what's my name, where do you live, who's your mom. You know, we're in a fight. We're fighting. So this is, this is, this is what it got me. They're, they're fighting. They're fighting. It say they've been fighting for a long time. They, they've been wrestling. Jacob, you know, he's, he's tough. He won't let the angel go until he's blessed. Uh, the angel is telling him a new season is coming, Jacob. And Jacob said, uh -uh, you won't go until you bless me. But this is the problem. The angel cannot bless Jacob the way he is. Jacob has to realize and own his 5%. You with me? So when the angel, you know, you can see Jacob fighting, calling him names, you know. <clears throat> Have you seen the, the, the bull fight with, with, the, with the, uh, the, the Spanish, when, when the bull is... <laughs> 
So I can see Jacob, you know, you're going to bless me. You already defeated my brother, my father, my father-in-law, my brothers-in-law. You're going to bless me. So the angel say, what is your name? And what do you care about my name? Bless me. And I see Jacob, you know. Then he started to evaluate and go back. 40 years ago, he was in the same position. He was fighting for a blessing. And at that time, when they asked him for his name, his response was, my name is Esau. My name is Esau. Remember? So the angel asked him, what is your name? So Jacob said, I have three options. Walk away and lose my blessing. Lie to the angel of God, which is not a good idea. Or recognize my 5%. So when he answered and he said, my name is Jacob. He confronted his past and he knew he'd been lying. He knew that, his, that the life he's living was the result of his bad decision, of his character. So when the angel asked him, what is your name? You know, I can see in the spiritual world, angels, I can hear music, spirit break out interceding for Jacob because they were seeing you, you and me on Jacob's decisions because whenever we make a decision it has a social impact on people related to me on my next generations and the next generation so I can hear the music playing the spirit break out can you hear it? and I can hear the holy name asking you what is your name? What is your name? What is your name? I can hear the Holy Spirit saying, let's look at the 5% of your blame. Maybe for you it's 1%. Let's look at the 1% of your blame. You cannot smuggle your blame to your future. It won't work out. It won't work out. You cannot bring your blame to the future. You cannot bring your blame to the next season. You have to be confronted. So I'm asking you, what is your name? What is your name? What is your 5% of blame? What is your name? What is your name? I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Spirit of the living God. 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 I've been fighting with myself. I've been fighting with others. I've been fighting with the circumstance. I've been fighting with guilty. I've been fighting with sin. I've been fighting. Spirit of the living God. Oh, come on.
Spirit. So if you're feeling like God is talking to you, I'm going to ask you to do something different. If you're feeling this is for you, you're in the right place. You don't have to be ashamed. You're in a safe place. I'm just going to ask you, this is you, this is you, this is you. I need to deal with my 5%. I need to confront. I need to take ownership. I'm going to ask you to stand up. And as you do, a breakthrough is going to come to your life. Come on, come on. I know it's painful. I know it's shameful. I know, I know nobody wants to look into the past. Come on. Yes, yes, yes. One more person, one more person. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jesus, come back to life. Come on, and Jacob, I like to have control. I am Jacob. Nobody tells me what to do. I am Jacob. I'm dominant. I'm I'm deceitful. Come on. Spirit break out. I have been deceived by my own desires, my own sins, my own way of doing things, my own belief. My belief system is corrupted. 